Peter B. Collins News and Comments. It's Monday, November 28th, 2016. This is my premiere podcast from the new Secret Studio. We took a long break over Thanksgiving and moved from the original Secret Studio, where I'd been ensconced for some 15 years. And I'm at a new location where I have a separate room for the studio. And I've got some upgraded facilities here. And I also have lowered rent. It is the perfect combination. And worth the effort of packing up, purging all that stuff, and <laughs> restashing it in a new office space. And uh, as I begin today, there's a lot of news to talk about and comment on. But I want to thank a guy who made all this possible. His name is Raul Velez. We worked at a radio station together more than 20 years ago. And he has been the technical guru for the Peter B. Collins podcast, uh, well, since it began over uh, seven years ago. He also supported my syndicated radio show and has always been there when I needed help. And he does it for free. It's a really incredible act of generosity on his part. And uh, you're hearing me now because of the work of Raul Velez. So, Raul, I tip my hat to you, and thank you very much. So while I was off on the break, Fidel Castro died, Jill Stein launched a recount in three states, and Donald Trump, well, <laughs> he is tweeting uh, in contradictory manner. We'll take these one by one. Fidel Castro was 90 years old. His death did not come as a surprise. But it does unleash a lot of emotion. There are many people who thought of Fidel Castro as a demonic despot, as a dictator who locked up political prisoners and who ran a communist government even after other big communist nations like Russia and China had given up on pure Marxism. For me, Fidel Castro is the guy who outlived the Yankee demon that tried so many different ways to kill him, to strangle the island with an embargo and blockade. And Fidel da Castro, with uh, <laughs> the passive compliance of the Cuban people, outlived all of the presidents who tried to run circles around him. Only Queen Elizabeth is a world leader who has been in her chair longer then Fidel Castro ran Cuba. He took over in the uh, revolution in January of 1959. And a lot of ink, a lot of pixels have been spilled about Fidel Castro. There isn't a whole lot that I can add. But I would like to recommend that you Google or do a search at PeterBCollins.com for Tom Hayden. And there are two interviews. One was the retrospective I put together when Tom died in October. And the other is the interview that I did with Tom about uh, oh, 12, 13 months ago. Uh, well, it was the summer of 2015 about his book called Listen, Yankee. And Tom Hayden was uh, a guy who was a revolutionary here in the United States. And his book, Listen, Yankee, was uh, a very powerful expression of how he and his Cuban counterpart uh, led revolutionary activities, took on uh, big governments, sometimes won, sometimes lost. And I recommend Tom Hayden's commentary about Cuba to you. Now, the Trump team is seizing this as an opportunity to rile up the reactionaries in Miami and elsewhere. And we're seeing a lot of angst coming out of the Trump transition team. They're threatening to terminate the deal that uh, Barack Obama struck to reopen Cuba. Now, Congress has not lifted the embargo. So these are matters that are subject to the discretion of a president. And what Obama did can be reversed by Donald Trump. And we have to wonder whether the political value of pandering to the Miami Cubans will Trump, pardon the expression, the business interests that Donald Trump would probably see in a, a hotel and casino there in Havana. 
So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how all this plays out. There's a lot of heated rhetoric right now, and Trump is in some ways uh, allowing hotheads like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio to set the tone here. Ted Cruz has said new, no U.S. officials should attend Castro's funeral on the 4th of December, and I think that would be a serious mistake. I don't expect President Obama to go, although I'd be delighted if he chooses to. Vladimir Putin, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, Prime Minister Theresa May of England have already decided they will not attend the funeral. For Russia, it's kind of a statement that uh, Cuba is no longer an important client nation. And Putin is sending the uh, chairman of the lower house of parliament, whose name is Volodin, and also the uh, British are, are sending a lower-level official. The Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, made some comments over the weekend that were pretty carefully calibrated, but because he didn't call uh, Castro a desperate dictator or something like that, he has been uh, taking a pounding from American right-wingers. And uh, here's a little more of a quote from Ted Cruz. He said, if you wouldn't go to Pol Pot's funeral or Stalin's funeral or Mao's funeral because they were murderous communist dictators, then you shouldn't be doing what Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau are doing, which is celebrating Fidel Castro, a murderous communist dictator. Now, the inconsistencies here, the selective outrage, are apparent. Because of the communist tag, that makes, you know, Fidel Castro beyond any <laughs> anything positive. And we put up with despots and dictators and go to their funerals worldwide. But if they're communists or Cuban, then those are very special categories. Well, while I was moving, I got an email from Greg Palast saying that Jill Stein had just called him to announce that the Green Party is filing for recounts in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And in short order, Jill Stein has raised uh, somewhere north of $6 million. That's much more than she raised for her Green Party presidential campaign during the past year. But I believe that this is a worthwhile effort. Will it change the outcome? It's going to take a miracle. But with the margin attributed to Trump in Michigan of just 11,600 votes. In Wisconsin, it's just over 27,000. Pennsylvania is a bigger hurdle, 68,000. But I welcome any effort to expose election fraud. And all the talk in the corporate media is about voter fraud. That's what Trump tweets about. That's what the Republicans make a big deal about. But the real issue is election fraud. And as Greg Palace shared with us just after the election, the election was rigged in Trump's favor by the suppression schemes that eliminated millions of voters who most likely would have voted for the Democrat. And so Jill Stein is in the curious position. She doesn't even have the backing of whatever the Central Committee of the Green Party is. She's doing this on her own as a presidential candidate. And she has standing to bring these recount requests. But it won't help her out. She can't possibly engineer the displacement of Trump and the insertion of Jill Stein uh, as the outcome of this election. So what's fascinating is that uh, Jill Stein is leading the charge to try to establish some election integrity in this country. And the Clinton team hemmed and hawed. And, of course, I think they're brushed back by two things. One is that Donald Trump is indicating he won't pursue further investigations or charges against Hillary over the Family Foundation or the email scandal. And number two, Hillary put her foot in her mouth during the campaign in trying to shame Trump by saying that uh, it's uh, you know inconceivable that a major party candidate wouldn't accept the outcome of the election. So her lawyer, Mark Elias has said that, well, there's no actionable evidence of vote hacking, but since there's a recount, uh, we're going to represent the interests of Clinton voters. Now that a recount has been initiated in Wisconsin, we intend to participate in order to ensure the process proceeds in a manner that is fair to all sides. So Hillary Clinton doesn't even want to fight. 
for, even if it's considered a remote chance, that a recount could change the results. It certainly could change the outcome in Michigan, and it's not far-fetched to imagine that it could change the results in Wisconsin. And by one count, if you flip those two states, Hillary Clinton wins the Electoral College by six votes. Now, here's another interesting element, right? You heard Mark Elias say, that, well, no actionable, and said, we don't expect much to come out of this. I got a fundraising note from Democrats.org today saying Donald Trump lost the popular vote by more than two million votes. Fewer people voted for, for him than his opponent, and he can't stand it. But even by his low standards, this is despicable. Yesterday, Trump launched into a trademark Twitter rant about why he's losing the popular vote. His new theory, supported by exactly zero evidence, is that he's losing because millions of Americans illegally voted against him. That's BS. Well, I agree with this right up until this point. Then they say, chip in $3 or more to stand with the Democrats as we take on Trump together. Come on! The Democrats didn't lift a finger. Now, they're getting on the Jill Stein-driven bandwagon here, and they're trying to raise money around it. That's the real scam, <laughs> if you want to give any credence to the tweets of Donald Trump. And meanwhile, on Friday, the Obama White House issued a statement that despite the efforts by Russia to undermine the president presidential election, it has concluded that the results accurately reflect the will of the American people. Now, <laughs> I don't know what they base this on, but they're ignoring the voter suppression schemes, the cross-check list that Greg Palast exposed, the numerous efforts to deny likely Democratic voters their franchise, and the Obama White House says, uh, pay no attention to that. It's Trump. Just get over it. So then, over the weekend, Trump first dismisses Jill Stein's effort as just a scam by the Green Party for an election that's already been conceded, and the results of this election should be respected instead of being challenged and abused. That's the uh, one part of a schizophrenic personality who uses Twitter. <laughs> so then on Sunday, as he was flying back to New York from Florida, Donald Trump hit the Twitter button again. And he started saying that uh, he actually won the popular vote. He said, except that uh, millions of people fraudulently were permitted to vote against him. And he offers no evidence of this. Then, in a second tweet, there, there were many of them, he referred to serious voter fraud in Virginia, New Hampshire, and California. Now, even if he thinks there was serious voter fraud in California, Hillary won this state by double digits. There is no possibility that Trump can change that. So what he has done is really <laughs> put his foot in his mouth in a very big way. And he did it digitally, of course, so that's even better. But, uh, you know, this is crazy talk. And the corporate media now refers to Trump as spinning conspiracy theories about a fraudulent outcome of the election committed by voters, not by election officials. And this is where the corporate media gets it so wrong. And, of course, Trump is wrong, too. But there's more than one way to be wrong. <laughs> and I guess this is a, a very good example of just that. So Trump uh, got obsessive, fixated is the word used uh, in one news account of his attention to this issue. The afternoon messages followed a string of early morning posts. In one of them, he said Hillary Clinton conceded the election when she called me just prior to the victory speech and after the results were in. Nothing will change. So his emotions are on display here for all of us to see. And on the one hand, he claims that he would have won the popular vote, but it doesn't matter. It's the Electoral College vote under the system that we currently have that decides the outcome. 
And so for him, on the one hand, to say, doesn't matter, you know, I built my campaign to win the Electoral College. And then on the other hand, because his ego gets bruised, he's got to claim that he was defrauded of the popular vote. This shows what a, a sick, twisted fuck <laughs> has been designated as president-elect. So election officials in those three states are going to have to work extended hours and weekends because the deadline of December 13 is when the certified results have to be submitted to uh, wherever they get submitted to. And in uh, Wisconsin, each county is being asked to submit their estimated costs. The recount will begin on Thursday after the campaigns uh, wire the money to the, uh, I guess, the counties or to the state of Wisconsin. Stein is also, oh, and by the way, in addition to uh, the uh, challenge by Jill Stein, Reform Party uh, presidential candidate Rocky De La Fuente has also filed a petition for a recount in Wisconsin. Uh, I don't know if he put up a credit card to pay for his share of the cost. We'll uh, see if that comes out in the wash. So Stein is also challenging the results in Pennsylvania, where the deadline to file a lawsuit for a recount comes this evening, and Michigan, whose deadline is on Wednesday. I read one account that Michigan is a little complicated, that you have to assert fraud in each county or each precinct, and also in one of these states, uh, I think it's Pennsylvania, you have to get a, an individual in each precinct. Oh, here it is. Three voters in each of Pennsylvania's voting precincts must file affidavits demanding the state revisit the results, and then each vote will be reexamined by hand. So I don't know if that's even achievable at this point. Uh, but overall, I support this effort, and I will be surprised if it changes the outcome. But there is nothing wrong with counting and recounting the votes. And... I do support it. I'm also hoping to talk to Jonathan Simon, the mathematician and election integrity activist who wrote the original Redshift documents, and I'll get that interview to you in the next few days, if at all possible. Also, during the break, the Washington Post set a new low in smear journalism, and c comparing it to McCarthyism is not out of line. On Thursday, they released an article by reporter T Craig Timberg, headlined, Russian propaganda effort helped spread fake news during election, experts say. Now, these experts are completely unknown. They are anonymous. They have a website called Prop or Not, which is short for Propaganda or Not, and it claims that millions of Americans have been deceived this year in a massive Russian misinformation campaign. And they name names like WikiLeaks, The Drudge Report, also Truth Out, The Black Agenda Report, Truth Dig, Naked Capitalism, Antiwar.com, and the Ron Paul Institute. Uh, I'm a little burned that the Peter B. Collins podcast was left out. Uh, Glenn Greenwald and The Intercept were not included in this list. But this is a blacklist, pure and simple. It's a blacklist coming from an unattributed source that is amplified by the Washington Post. And editor Marty Barron wrote, Russian propaganda effort helps spread fake news during election, say independent researchers. Well, but as Greenwald points out, not one individual at the organization is named. The executive director is quoted without being named. And the group, uh, as Greenwald writes, thus embodies the toxic essence of Joseph McCarthy, but without the courage to attach individual names to the blacklist. And so uh, they also have modified some of their accusations. Initially, they listed a number of organizations as allies, and yet these allies said they've never heard of the group, they don't have anything to do with it, and so allies have now been uh, re-described as uh, related projects. <laughs> But this is just another example of the corporate media lowering its standards to achieve a particular outcome. And this is to promote the idea that Russia interfered with our elections. I also read a couple of other pieces over the weekend. I think one was from Esquire. And I remain unconvinced that Russia had any direct role in uh, the outcome of our elections, either by hacking 
or by the disinformation campaigns that have been blamed on it. Also, a- another low point for the Washington Post today, Mark Thiessen, or Tyson, has published a piece that rewrites uh, the history of torture under the Bush administration. And it is a puff piece that promotes a new book by James E. Mitchell. He's uh, one of the duo exposed by Jason uh, Leopold, who were the contractors who earned $81 million to devise a torture scheme for the U.S. military and intelligence communities. And Mitchell is promoting a new book, and Tyson... uh, uh, This is bizarre. Let me quote this. He says, Mitchell is an American patriot who's been unjustly persecuted for his role in crafting an interrogation program that helped stop terrorist attacks and saved countless lives. He doesn't shy from the controversies, pulls no punches in describing the interrogations. If anything, the readers may be surprised by the compassion he showed these mass murderers. But the real news in his book is what happened after enhanced interrogations ended and the terrorists began cooperating. So they're trying to claim that torture works. The Post is greasing the way for Donald Trump to re-engage in torture if he becomes president and to promote that book and describe him as a great patriot. That's really disgusting. Over at the New York Times, James Risen drew the uh, co-assignment to write about this. Instead of promoting the book, which gets a mention, he notes that James uh, Mitchell and his old buddy Bruce Jessen are on trial in Spokane, Washington, in federal court, a case brought by two former detainees in CIA secret prisons and the representative of a third man named Gull, who died under uh, (laughs) under their custody in a torture chamber in Afghanistan. And the New York Times story is, I think, much more balanced, and it does note the important uh, role of this court and its judge, Justin Quackenbush. He has resisted efforts to dismiss the case, but a new Trump administration could put more pressure to impose uh, state secrets uh, uh, type arguments. Now to Standing Rock where protesters continued to mass. The population there has grown over the holiday. And I understand that Veterans for Peace is dispatching a contingent of veterans who will be at Standing Rock in the next few days. And the Army Corps of Engineers is attempting to shut down the protests by saying that, well, you know, it gets cold in the winter and it's out there on the in, <laughs> in Nowheresville. And so the Corps of Engineers has sent a letter to the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and saying that as of the 5th of December, the uh, uh, area there where they have been protesting will be shut down and they're setting up a caged free speech zone. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Uh, where the protesters can conduct their First Amendment protected activities. Now, the response from the assembled protesters there, mm, not so much. Here's a quote from uh, one of the Native American leaders. We will no longer give you what you want. When rocks stand together, the river goes around them. We will never be moved by you. So the Corps of Engineers, which is not really in control of the tribal lands here, I don't know where they feel they have the authority to do this, offer this phony argument. This decision is necessary to protect the general public from the violent confrontations between protesters and law enforcement officials that have occurred in this area, to prevent death, illness, or serious injury to inhabitants of encampments due to the harsh North Dakota winter conditions. (laughs) The necessary emergency medical and fire response service, law enforcement, or sustainable facilities to protect people from these conditions cannot be provided. Well, the Native Americans are ready to build winter mud huts. They can survive. What they can't survive is the attacks by law enforcement officials. The violence is coming from the government and from the goons who are hired by the pipeline company. So I think this confrontation will continue, and President Obama is still out of sight, not willing to get involved. Some international briefs here. The 
new despot. He's not new, but he's newly a despot. Uh, I'm referring to the president of Turkey, Erdogan, has issued a new threat. He's willing to use refugees to extort membership in the European Union. Now, the EU had agreed to pay him up to six billion dollars, uh, six billion euros, over the next couple of years in exchange for keeping migrants from heading to Europe. But the deal was that there would be talks about Turkish membership. It was not a guarantee that they would be offered membership in the European Union. And the European Parliament voted on Thursday to suspend those talks. And so Erdogan is going to use these hapless refugees as a bargaining chip with the leaders of Europe. We're told that the battle around Aleppo is reaching a critical point, perhaps a turning point. Thousands of people have, flee, have fled for their lives today as rebel fighters lost a large stretch of territory in the northern Syrian city. And Kurdish fighters on one side, Syrian forces on the other, are making a pincer move. And it is believed that uh, the Islamic State may be on the lam from the Aleppo area very soon. Here's some very bad news based on bad interpretations of a bad law. The law I'm referring to was the blank check, the author of authorization for the use of military force. that was passed shortly after 9-11, and it gave George W. Bush almost unlimited power to pursue uh, al-Qaeda and others thought to be behind the September 11th events. Well, now the Obama administration is stretching that blank check to cover al-Shabaab, and to say that under the 2001 law, the administration and its successor has the right to go into countries where al-Qaeda was not present on 9-11 and attack groups that were not even formed for five or six years after that. And it's not limited to the areas where al-Shabaab is active. The Obama administration has also loosened the rules of engagement for Libya, for Afghanistan. And this is what Donald Trump will inherit. It is really, really <laughs> incredible and unconscionable that Obama is essentially taking these powers and going to pass them along because he has not been challenged by Congress or the courts. And we're seeing an expansion of presidential power that is deeply alarming, particularly when the guy who I, advise, who I described earlier, who gets upset when people tweet about him in a way that he doesn't like, is in charge and can deploy forces at will. Kudos to the New York Times for a lengthy story that originated in Sunday's paper. And they put a bunch of excellent reporters on it, uh, detailing the many and deep conflicts of interest that Donald Trump has, or that are posing, uh, 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 <laughs> that that are posed to him by his uh, presumed ascension to the presidency on January 20th. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast. I encourage you to read it. it shows, for example, that in the Philippines, one of his uh, development partners has been named the ambassador to the United States. And so the Philippines is seeing opportunities where they can have conflicted ambassadors who deal with a conflicted president of the United States to advance their private interests in ways that uh, are deeply in conflict with our laws and the emoluments clause of our Constitution. And finally today, jury selection is underway in Charleston. There was quite a bit of legal maneuvering over the past week as Dylan Roof, who is accused of killing nine black parishioners at a Charleston church in June of 2015, was declared competent to stand trial. Jury selection, as I mentioned, is underway. And Dylan Roof has announced that he will be representing himself. What's deeply troubling here is that, uh, you know, I, I don't have too much doubt that Dylan Roof committed these crimes. But he's going to serve as his own counsel. And Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, made the decision to pursue the death penalty in this case over the clear objections 
of the survivors and family members of that church shooting. They showed great grace and a kind of Christian behavior that most public Christians never display in this country. They forgave Dylan Roof, and they have called on prosecutors to seek life without parole and not the death penalty. But the prosecutors aren't listening. And that's just another episode in the administration of Barack Obama. Thanks for joining me today for this first news and po- <laughs> news and comment podcast. I know I can say it from the news studio here. I remain Peter B. Collins, and I welcome your comments. You can email Peter at PeterBCollins.com. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.